Um, I'm sure a vast majority of you probably have agreed that you or someone you know have felt your concerns or perspectives have been ignored due to one or more social or cultural differences, like your race, right, your ethnicity, maybe your body type, maybe uh, your language barrier or those particular things, and also other unique differences. And these differences are representing, right, um, underrepresented and minority individuals, not just in terms of uh, race or ethnicity, right, but in terms of also societal expectations, right, that are placed on us, those societal norms and expectations that are forced on us. And so for a long time, the ideal body type, let's say maybe was hmm, a negative seven, right? And of course, that perspective may change based on cultural or family influences. For instance, uh, I can't speak for all black individuals, but based on my personal experience, I've had friends and family sit me down and have real serious conversations. And they're like, you know, Christina, we really need to talk to you. And I'm like, OK, what, what's going on? I'm nervous. And they're like, um, are you doing OK? Are you stressed? Do you have enough money for food? I'm like, uh, yeah. And they're like, uh, you just, you're not thick enough. Like, you just bony, right? Are you sure? Like, you're not going through some problems or no, you're busy. And so maybe you can relate, right? Maybe it's not your weight expectations, but maybe you have family members that are always trying to get you to conform to gender stereotypes or gender roles, um, saying things like you should dress more feminine or don't you want kids, right? When are you gonna have kids? So with this in mind, even if we don't have these personal experiences ourselves, if we're honest, and we open our eyes, we can see that everything around us is generally dominated by majority and hegemonic views or standpoints. And so essentially it's all in the numbers, right? We see underrepresentation in the media, advertising, right? Even in our laws, in our institutions of education and in our workplaces, right? We can see that manifested there. And so what I'm going to do is I am actually going to try to put the another link into the Q&A. OK, we'll see if it works this time. If not, then I'll do my plan option two, which is use another type of uh, link. OK. All right, so for the first question, we see that a vast majority of you said that at least sometimes, right, you grow impatient when trying to understand someone with a foreign accent. And that is not a surprise, right? That correlates and agrees with research findings. And then also, a majority of you also said that at least somewhat you feel that organizations need to go beyond just stating, right? They embrace diversity and they also need to engage in more action. They can improve upon that. And so thank you for participating in that. We are actually going to go back into the PowerPoint now. So these particular responses, right? They show that even as minorities and underrepresented individuals and institutions seeking to further inclusion, none of us are perfect. Right, we are too guilty of being non inclusive or even discriminatory at times, and we can always approve, improve, excuse me. And so, but with that being stated, it takes coming to the realization and having that difficult conversation that's often very uncomfortable and acknowledging that in the US in particular, right, we were built on systemically racist and oppressive values. And those values, those trickle over into our practices, right, and our procedures and our institutions. And these institutions are our institutions of justice, right, our legal institutions, our institutions of education, labor, all of those different institutions and so much more. And so with that stated, we have to continually assess those documents that govern our institutions for inclusivity, or the lack thereof. 
And so as a licensed attorney, uh, again, pursuing my PhD in communication, one of the things that I study is how messages right, are communicated through our laws, regulations, and policies, and what those messages communicate about equity climate. And when I say equity climate, I mean, what do the messages say, right, about equity, about fairness, about belonging in our institutions, right? And so with that being said, one of the main objectives that I want to uh, get at today and have you walk away doing from this presentation is to have a better idea when you leave here of how to identify non-inclusive and discriminatory language within institutional regulations and policies that have may uh, been difficult to detect previously. So moving on, we're actually going to look at these policies here. I'll give you several seconds to just kind of glance over these, pay attention to these. OK, so a vast majority of you said that both policies need to be rewritten. OK. That is. Awesome that you both said that, and so let's kind of get into the reasons why. Right, so in law, when we are determining whether, say, a legal provision or regulation discriminates or not, there are several ways that we assess that. And one of those ways is if a policy, for example, is discriminatory per se. So meaning on its face, is there detectable, right, overt discrimination that is a lot of times considered intentional, right? And that we can see here, with this language, we can clearly see that that's overt, that's detectable, that's intentional, right? But another way is by also looking at what we call discriminatory effects or consequences. And this often arises when a policy is not blatantly discriminatory, but if we read between those lines, right, there are implicit consequences that would be uh, disproportionately affecting specific groups. So these defects or effects are often undetectable and overt and unintentional, but nevertheless, they still have these injurious consequences, right? So we can see here the policy says no earrings on males are allowed. Well, it doesn't say that all employees can't wear earrings. It just says male. So what is the reason for that, right? It goes back to these dominant hegemonic views that permeate our institutions. So this is going to disproportionately impact persons who identify or express their gender in ways that don't conform to those gender roles or those stereotypes, right? And then also we have here, hairstyles should not draw any attention, right? Height, length, for example. And so here is a problem. And why is it a problem? Because the language is very ambiguous, brings attention to what does that actually mean, right? And clauses like this have shown to primarily impact black and brown communities. Um, and I know you're saying like, okay, yeah, language is ambiguous, it's broad, but come on, right? Can you really take it that far? Like, yeah, it could happen, but it's kind of unrealistic. Like, okay, that's taking it a little bit too far. But if that was the case, right, why would we need the Crown Act, right? Why are we advocating in 2019, beginning in 2019, still continuing to advocate for the Crown Act to protect people with Afro textured hair from being discriminated against, right? Why is this student being potentially uh, facing repercussions because her hair is considered to be distracting? Right. Why is this teen not able to get a job because of his dreads? Um, so those are some of the things that we want to consider. And we see these are really realistic uh, consequences as a result of how policies are written. Now, other examples that we have here. Are policies that favor able bodied persons, right? policies with discriminatory effects against lower income individuals, um, which of course is inordinately tied to race in many circumstances, 
right? We see English only policies and sexual harassment policies that don't protect gender identity or expression. And last, we see differences in maternity and paternity leave policies. And that actually brings me to a recent case with Chase Bank. And so they actually settled for $5 million because their leave policy essentially was providing more time for mothers uh, rather than fathers. It wasn't the same, right? And fathers who wanted more time had to essentially jump through hurdles to prove that they were primary caretakers. But, you know, the crazy thing is, is that Chase intended for its policy to be gender neutral, right? So I'm sure they had HR, legal, compliance, all of those different departments involved. But if you're not, again, assessing your policies for these types of things, you can easily miss it. If you're just saying, well, the law requires this, right? And nothing more. And we met the law and the legal requirements. Uh, yeah, that's true. But also, what is that communicating about equity, right, and equality? And uh, what what are those consequences? And so the initial policy, uh, which has been changed since, again, reinforces these norms, right, by prioritizing this idea of the nuclear family. So you have, of course, a biological female, biological male, they make a baby, and the father goes out in the workforce, right, to bring home the bread and butter, the mother stays at home and she can cleans and tends to the children. So, but what about other family structures? What about those that don't conform to those gender roles that have been forced on us by society, right? And so now moving on, I know you're wondering, hey, she said body type in the beginning, but she probably just said that because she wanted to relate to everybody. But there are actually policies that are inequitably forced uh, against persons with certain body types. Um, so I don't know if you all remember, but in 2016, there was this teacher here. She was referred to as Teacher Bay all over the internet, and she was shamed, body shamed, um, all over social media because of her attire. And the major issue here was not actually right the dress itself, but it was that she had a very curvy beautiful, by the way, body that resulted in harsh critiques and judgments. And uh, that would have not likely occurred if she was that negative size seven, right? Um, so this didn't result in any punishment for her, but uh, I use this example to show that words like distracting or phrases like brings attention to can obviously be open to various interpretations, right? And that can lead to inequitable enforcement. And we actually see that manifested in cheerleading, in particular with social media policies. Um, there are clauses stating things like don't post photos that are embarrassing, revealing, degrading, inappropriate, but they don't have examples to specify what that is. And in professional cheerleading in particular, there have been legal complaints and even lawsuits, right, involving allegations where cheerleaders with certain body, body types have uh, felt discriminated against. And so we see that occurring in real life. All right, so now that you have a better understanding of how to detect bias, right, reading in between those lines, now it's time as leaders to use those tools to correct it. And to clarify, you can be a leader as a result of your title, your position. However, you can also be a leader for a certain task or even in the moment, right, if you're called on to offer insight or for your advice, for example. So first of all, we all want to put aside our pride and open our eyes, right? Again, we want to recognize that racism and oppression does exist. It's not saying that you yourself are a racist or the oppressor, right? But it is saying, hey, we acknowledge that this exists and we can improve, right? And when we have that mindset, we're more on alert and we're thinking about those implications. We also want to rid of one-off diversity trainings and integrate those things into our daily culture. We want to be able to use our UDL guidelines, thinking about inclusive instruction and how that carries over into our syllabus. 
and we want to ensure that our daily practices align with what's in writing and get those diverse perspectives from everyone. And in closing, we want to be deliberately inclusive about our communication, not be overbroad, right, in our language, assess and evaluate our policies again and again. And we want to be advocates. And we want to be able to network and build those bridges in order to understand each other better and educate each other better.